What's good, y'all? You're listening to Code Switch. I'm Gene Demby. And today, I want to ask a question I've been thinking about a lot lately. And that's, how well do we know our parents? Like, who they were before and outside of being our parents? We know the broad biographical details of their lives, like when and where they were born, where they went to school, how they met each other. But a lot of their lives before us can be kind of opaque. Maybe we just never really got around to asking them about it. Maybe they didn't get around to telling us about it. Or maybe they didn't tell us a lot of stuff about themselves because talking about those things is just so hard. All those dynamics were true for Lisa Fu and her mother, Lon. There were so many things Lisa didn't know about her mother's life before her mother moved to the U.S. when she was fleeing the war in Cambodia, which meant there were a whole bunch of things that Lisa didn't know about herself. Like the fact that Lisa is ethnically Chinese. Lisa didn't find that out until she was in her 20s. It was like one of those big deal things that they just never got around to talking about for some reason. That's probably something a lot of us can relate to, like not having a lot of practice, being open and gracious with our parents. But a few years ago, Lisa gave birth to her first daughter, Acacia, and her mother came to meet her first grandchild, but also to take care of Lisa for a little while. Yes. Isn't she cute though? Yes, she's cute, yes. She's a new level. <laughs> Your first grandkid, first grandkid. And that time wasn't exactly easy. Like, a lot of their old points of tension still resurfaced. They were still there. But the two of them started talking, like, really talking about motherhood and about Lon's life before she was Lisa's mother. Back in Cambodia, when she left her oldest daughter behind to escape a civil war and the genocide. And that turned out to be the beginning of a conversation they kept having for years. And Lisa, being a journalist, was like, all right, I should report out my mother's story. And the result of all of that reporting is a moving new podcast called, appropriately, Before Me. We caught up with Lisa Fu to talk about her podcast, her mom, and herself. I would write about my family's past, um, my family's story at various points in my life. And I knew I had all these holes and gaps in the story. Um, it was like, okay, I need to get this right sometime. Hmm. So you were getting the, the, the details like in dribs and drabs, but not as like the story story. Yeah, I mean... You know, I grew up with only a fragmented understanding of my mom and my family's story Mm -hmm. before I was born. Um, They first came to America two months before I was born. Um, My mom was pregnant with me during her escape, her time in the refugee camp, and her coming to America. So I grew up knowing some things, you know, that they were refugees from Cambodia, um, that they escaped by boat, um, that my dad wasn't around because he was arrested at some point during the escape. So I knew these, like, little things and grew up, you know, the years passed, but I always had this, like, child understanding of their story. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it was just, I, I loved writing it just, it always seemed to me at some point I would find out what happened and, and write about it. Why did you decide to tell the story now in this moment? I discovered that I loved audio storytelling and got my first job in public radio. And so I figured that the story ought to be told in an audio format. Mm-hmm. And then I had my first daughter, And she was going to come visit for three weeks. And just logistically, it was like, we're together for three weeks. Um, So I'm going to start this interview. Right. If this is when it's going to happen, if this is going to happen, it's going to happen now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think for my mom, that was a big turning point for her sharing the stories. And um, it's because she thought that because I was becoming a parent that I could start to understand so I hmm. think for my mom, it, it it was like me becoming a parent was part of the key to like unlocking things. When my wife became a mother, she said that her own mother became way more legible to her, right? Like just all of the stuff that they had in common and didn't have in common, um, it became much easier to see like how her mom made certain decisions, like what her mom's motivations were. 
and that was like sort of an unspoken thing. They didn't have a testy relationship at all, but I think her mother just like made more sense to her. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like they have this giant thing in common now. They have motherhood in common. Yeah. Um, you know, aside from this project of like hearing all these stories and trying to like figure out who I am by understanding my past more, you know, by understanding my mom's story. There are like so many little things about my mom that I understand more um, by being a parent. Mm -hmm. Even stuff like as a parent, you hide things for your from your kids for like various reasons, right? Like you don't want to eat, mm -hmm. have them eat a snack or like a present. And I'm like totally, so my mom would like forget where she hid things. And we'd be like, Mom, how could you forget, you know? And now it's like, <laughs> you know, the holiday season. I'm like slowly buying stuff. And I'm like, where did I put all of that stuff? <laughs> so, I mean, those are like totally small things that I'm that I'm understanding more about my mom that, that really have nothing to do with the podcast. But um, <laughs> it's helpful nonetheless, you know? Absolutely. There's this moment early on in the podcast where your mom is telling... This really difficult story. She's remembering her oldest daughter. And she's clearly crying. And as I was listening, I was just really curious about what you were feeling in that moment as she was sharing this story and this emotion with you. Had you heard that story before? No, I never had heard that story before. Um, you know, I, I, growing up, I knew that my mom had another daughter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my mind, I was like, oh, she died during the war of illness. Like, it was just like I, I filled in the holes myself. Mm -hmm. And so when I asked my mom what happened, like, I had no idea, no idea of any of the details of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really hard to hear her tell it and to hear her get emotional. I mean, growing up, I think I heard my mom cry once, mm -hmm. ever. She's, like, such a strong woman. And so... During this interview process, she did it a few times. And that was really that was really hard to know that me asking these questions was bringing up this pain. Mm -hmm. And even now, like as the story is coming out into the world, I wonder if I'm being responsible with the stories and her feelings. And, uh, you know, she listened to the first episode and when it came out and she sent me a text just like, great job, you know, this was good. Hmm. And I was kind of like, phew, you know, <laughs> like I felt okay. Um, but when we talked the other night, she thanked me, which I was not expecting at all. But she said that, you know, the stories had been in her and they were kind of like burning. And that to get them out was like, you know, a release. Hmm. And so that was just, um, that was amazing for me to hear. You say that the two of you both missed just a lot of opportunities to talk about her past. Um, your mother would mention something about her life, and like neither of you would really dwell on it, even when it was a pretty powerful sort of uh, remark. Yeah. You said that like you didn't even know you were ethnically Chinese until you were an adult, until you were around twenty. Like, what did you? <laughs> what did you think you were before then? Like, what did you think your family story was before then in terms of like how they identified ethnically? You know, I'd, I'd heard a lot about Cambodia, obviously, and Vietnam, and mm -hmm. um, I, I thought I was part one of those. Right. It's, like, ridiculous to be like, I didn't know which part of one of those I was. <laughs> but I— um, Sure. The summer after my sophomore year in college, I went on my first backpacking trip. And, huh. you know, it was total tourist backpacker. Went through Vietnam— Cambodia, Thailand. And when I came home and told my mom that, like, oh, it was so cool to be in Vietnam and feel so connected, mm -hmm. you know, to to our family and our culture. And my mom kind of like turns to me, looks at me and was like, you are Chinese. You are 100% Chinese blood. Wow. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And that was seriously the first time I ever realized that. Wow. It's weird to think that I didn't ask questions, but I think that was just my, like, default mode growing up and a lot of my early adulthood. How did 
the way you think about your identity change once you learn that you were Chinese? Like, I imagine you don't suddenly feel like Chinese, but like, how did you feel after you had this information? So it's not like I didn't know I was Chinese. I just didn't know that was all I was, right? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, like it was, I think it was more that like when she told me that, it was like such a like wake up call to like, how much I did not know. But, um, yeah, it, I've always struggled being Chinese. So it wasn't like that made that struggle more. Huh. You said you always struggled being Chinese. Can you say a little bit more about that? You know, my family was sponsored over by the Chappaqua Friends Meeting House. Um, and, you know, it was, it was we had a great upbringing. Um, and I was raised in Chappaqua, New York. Um, which is quite, you know, it's, there's all kinds of people who live there, but it's quite affluent. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, So I grew up in that environment um, and grew up with, around whiteness Mm -hmm. and would say that that was my primary association when it came to friends, um, culture, um, and uh, a lot of pushing away from from being different um, and being Chinese. And, right. uh, you know, where my mom was trying to force it on me, it largely was not who I was. Um, right. But then, like, me trying to, in my 20s, in my early adulthood, try to, like, embody that more and mm-hmm. realizing that, like, It was so hard, and it's something that I still struggle with Mm. Um, as a parent. And, um, you know, like, I know, like, you became a parent in in the past few years, right? Mm -hmm. In the last year, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's just like, I'm married to a white man, so, like, having mixed kids, um, Mm -hmm. there's just a lot. There's a lot there. (laughs) Yeah, yep, as I'm learning. My my wife is Indian, and so we're... We are raising a child who was black and in Indian, um, not half black, half Indian, but black and Indian. How do you think through these things? Like, how do you build community around a child so that they feel that they have purchase and, you know, and belonging in these very different spaces? Yeah, do you think you're doing it correctly? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I hope so. I want to shift gears a bit, speaking of assimilation. You know, immigration can be a really traumatic experience, even for people who move to a new country of their own volition. But it's especially traumatic for refugee and asylum seekers, like your mom, where the precipitating event for them moving is often some kind of catastrophe. So I wanted to ask you, how do you think her trauma showed up in your life as you were growing up? You know, the impetus for wanting to do this was knowing that, like, yeah, my family, they were refugees um, Mm -hmm. and that they survived this horrific thing. And, like, what was that horrific thing? Like, I wanted to know, right? Like, I wanted to know the stories and the details. And when she told them to me, I was, like, it's impossible for me to process and understand. But, like, what the series does, it, it goes, like, beyond the Khmer Rouge and the genocide, um, mm-hmm. she shares so much about her childhood and growing up and how much she loved Cambodia. Mm-hmm. And, like, she she talks so longingly about the food that she had there. And mm-hmm. she says this thing, which surprised me, which was that, like, oh, I never wanted to come here, you know? I didn't want to come to America. I knew it was going to be cold. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she... She was like, I wanted to stay in Cambodia. Right. It was so amazing for me to for for me to hear that side of her. And I think for her to like go back to that place, because a lot of it obviously is sad and tragic. Hmm. What do you think you would have told your children about your mother if your mother had never opened up to you for this project? You know, instead of me trying to answer your question, which is like what I would have said if I didn't get these hadn't done this project, I mean, that was, my goal was to record her voice, her laughter, her talking about her past, and have that be something that I can 
directly passed down to them. Hmm. So that was just really important for me to give to them. So many of us are really unpracticed and having like really intimate conversations with our parents, right? Like it, that seems so weird because, you know, we spend our whole lot or most of our early lives like in their care. We live with them. But like our parents are like these giant ciphers in a lot of ways, right? Like I want to have a conversation with my mom like you have with yours. Um, and the thought of all of the stuff we'd have to get through to do that is so scary. <laughs> it's just like so daunting and so frustrating. Like I'm already annoyed and I haven't even <laughs> asked the question yet, you know? <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally feel that. And I went through all of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, the thing, okay, that I can use as like the carrot, like the motivation, right? Besides getting the answers and the stories, right? Is that uh -huh. like when I press record, our relationship transformed. Huh. Um, like there wasn't the typical mother-daughter tension that's normally there. Because, you know, maybe the informal act of sitting down and doing this really foreign thing actually brings out the real people of who you two are, you know? Because you're not doing the same thing, the same routine, that same relationship. It's like you're doing something brand new. And mm -hmm. it was the best times of that visit. Huh. You know, like, I remember I interviewed her during a few different times, but like that first trip her last night, there was almost an urgency from both of us huh. to share what she could for me to ask those, like, questions. Because um, she knew she was leaving. Yeah. So as hard and as, or just, like, challenging or, like, emotionally fraught it is, like, it's just, like, totally worth it. And almost it's, like, those things, like, just fall away when you're in this, like, dynamic of the recorder's on and I care about you and want to hear these questions and she's caring about me and trusting me with her answers and her stories. It, she knew I truly cared and I was making space for it. We're still the same people. She'll still nag me and I'll still get annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, but I'm like so grateful for her. I, I always have been and I think this just gives me like another layer of gratitude. Coming up, Lisa and her mother Lon sit down for an intimate conversation in the first episode of Before Me. Well, you know, I just ask you some questions about your life. My life, oh my God, it's a long story. <laughs> Stay with us. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the Duckhorn Portfolio, Napa, California. Founded in 1976, the Duckhorn Portfolio's 10 luxury wineries include Pinot Noir Powerhouses, Calera, and Goldeneye, and household favorites Duckhorn Vineyards and Decoy. This holiday season, elevate your celebrations with some of wine country's most coveted wines. Discover more at duckhorn.com slash NPR. Gene, just Gene this week, Code Switch. We've been talking to the journalist Lisa Fu about her new podcast, which is called Before Me. It's from Self-Evident Media, and it's a five-part story that follows the life of Lisa's mother, Lan, as she fled the war and genocide in Cambodia. And you're about to hear the first installment of Lisa's podcast, where she and Lan talk about everything from motherhood to immigration to loss. Just to note that this episode includes descriptions of death during war, acts of genocide, and family separation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa and Lon. Hi, Hi Lon. <laughs> Hi, Lon. Welcome. <laughs> oh, wow. She's very good size. She's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Wow. This was the first time my mom met my daughter, Acacia, five days after she was born. It was early October 2016, and my mom had just flown from New York to my home in Juneau, Alaska. More beautiful than pictures. Isn't she? Her photo, yeah. Can you see her? Yeah. 
I'll do another one. Does she look more like Milan? Or like oh, I think she definitely look more like you. <laughs> I think it's yeah. the case for many grandparents, but my mom would transform with Acacia. <laughs> she laughed differently, and she laughed a lot. I was convinced she was having more fun with Acacia than I was. Look at her forehead. <laughs> look at that forehead. Everyone said, that that's her daddy's forehead. <laughs> 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 but the but she the, said half and half, yeah. Half and half. <laughs> yeah. Isn't she cute though? Yes, yeah, she's cute. Yes, she's adorable. <laughs> Your first grandkid, first grandkid. It was amazing to see my mom act this way, but it was also mixed with a lot of stress for me. My mom is a small woman who might be easily overlooked but she loves starting up conversations with strangers. She can be brutally honest with restaurant wait staff when they ask her how the food is, and she knows how to make an impression. This is what I wrote in my journal after our first full day together. Day one with mom makes me feel like it's going to be a long three weeks, but I also have to remind myself to be appreciative and enjoy the time and try not to argue with her. But we had epic fights. Fights where we both shouted and screamed and made each other cry. The kind of fights where you just keep pushing and pushing, wanting to hurt the other. At one point, I even told her maybe she should leave a week early because I knew that would crush her. This sounds crazy now, but I resented her helping me telling me to nap when Acacia was sleeping, scolding me for lifting something heavy, offering to fold laundry. In my everyday life, I do fine without my mom's help. So I thought, why should this time be any different? I wasn't able to accept her assistance happily. Of course, she was a mother too. And in the middle of all of this, She told me what happened after she gave birth to her first baby in her home country of Cambodia. I kind of moved to my mom just for a few months so she can take care of me. Because the Chinese tradition that within 100 days, you're not allowed to to live, to do anything, to cook. You know, for women, it's the only luxurious time, only vacation time when you have the baby. Usually they give you a hundred (laughs) days. Luxurious? Vacation? Didn't she have to get up at all hours of the night? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was a breastfeeding. I mean, the same thing. The baby's hungry. You have to feed. I changed her diaper. I don't think we have diaper before. So we just use the cloth. And my mom, the one, had to wash all the cloth, deal with the poops, you know. She would take care of all my laundry by hand. We didn't have a machine then. That's a big thing for women, you know. They don't expect us to do laundry within that 100 days. And she cooks, she make, you know, she cook for me, you know. And the tradition, I told you, very spicy pork with a lot of peppercorn, teriyaki style, add a little peppercorn. That's one one way. And another way is the uh, pork slide thin and stir fry with ginger and scallion. Well, we always eat that. Pretty much every single day, because they believe that will strengthen the baby's stomach, you know. She had tried to tell me about the pork, and I had brushed it off as crazy talk. But it was all important. She had been trying to tell me all along. This is likely obvious to everyone else, but my mom wasn't visiting me at one of the hardest times of my life to make it even harder. She wasn't offering to help because she thought I couldn't handle it or because she thought I was doing it wrong. She wasn't even there just to help. She was fulfilling a tradition. This is just what a Chinese mom does. She takes care of her daughter after she gives birth. This was a revelation to me. And afterward, I started accepting her help without resentment. I was able to nap and appreciate waking up to her cooking in the kitchen. The sounds and smells of someone else making dinner all of a sudden became miraculous. 
It did feel luxurious, and by accepting her help, I was simply fulfilling my role as a Chinese daughter. I can't say the rest of the visit was argument-free, but there was a lot more room for patience and understanding. My whole life, I've grown up knowing there was so much I didn't know about my family's past. Not just cultural traditions, but things like, what did happen to my mom's first daughter? I remember writing a story when I was six or seven about meeting this sister on a magic carpet ride. I've always had a narrative about what came before me, but it was something I put together from bits and pieces that I'd overheard. At various points in my life, when I tried writing about it, I always got something wrong. My mom would issue the corrections and edits after the school essay had been turned in or the magazine story published. For instance, I didn't know I was ethnically Chinese until I was 20 years old. Up until then, I thought I was also part Cambodian or Vietnamese, since these were the countries I heard most about growing up. I never asked my mom the most basic questions. But us being in the same location together for three weeks was my opportunity to finally do just that. Well, you know, just ask you some questions about your life. My life, oh my God, it's a long story. (laughs) I'm Lisa Fu, and you're listening to Before Me the five-part story that follows my mom's journey from Cambodia to America and the long overdue conversation that helped us connect over our family's history. In the years before my mom had her first child, her life was filled with uncertainty. She lived in Kampat, in the southern part of the country, When she was a teenager, the Vietnam War was going on next door, seeping into Cambodia. In 1969, the U.S. began bombing Cambodia in hopes of destroying Vietnamese communist camps and supply bases. Attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. This is the decision I have made. At the same time, Cambodia was having its own war between the Cambodian Republic and the domestic communist group called the Khmer Rouge. In the midst of all this, my mom got married. She was 17. My dad, Kisong, was 26. Both my mom and dad are Chinese and come from families who immigrated to Cambodia. After getting married, my mom immediately moved in with his family, And soon after, they had their first child. Her name was Ali. Your father, he had nothing to do with the baby. He did not wake up at night. He did not know how to change diapers. You know, it's not part of the man's responsibility in that Chinese culture. When they had their first kid, my mom and Kisong still lived in Kampat. By the way, I didn't grow up with my dad, so I sometimes refer to him as Kisong. He fixed watches and clocks for a living, and my mom ran a small business at the market, selling stuff like candy and laundry detergent. My parents and Ali lived with Kisong's parents and his brother's family. Kisong's brother was Kijok, and Kijok had six children, Living with extended family, growing up with grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins, that was the norm. My mom said Ali was a lovable baby. She even won the affection of Kisong's father, who normally didn't care for girls. He didn't like his own daughter and didn't pay attention to his other granddaughters. However, he likes my my daughter very much. Yeah. So he actually come to take a peek of her when she sleep, and he oh he stare at her, you know, he just love her. <laughs> very unusual. <laughs> you don't know why? I don't know why, but, but she's so she's so easy. She's very easy baby. She's so cute. She is so cute. <laughs> Life was relatively normal, normal for wartime. That is. 
My mom said bombings had been going on for a few years already. So even though my mom and her family were surrounded by war, it was still manageable. But that changed quickly. By 1974, Cambodia's civil war had more than doubled in intensity. The Khmer Rouge had gained control of most of the countryside, and their leader Pol Pot was terrorizing the cities, including where my family lived. It was becoming more and more apparent that in order to stay safe, they'd have to leave. We were sitting in the, in the, in the living room, talking, discussing when we're going to escape, when we're going to leave the house. And there's a, a bomb dropped on the street and a f- thousand hundred of fragments went into the house and one fragment just came right to here, right here. A piece of shrapnel landed right next to my mom. When we heard the bomb, we all leaned down to the floor. I was with your, your sister, holding your sister, leaning down, and all of a sudden I feel wet. I got wet. I wet and then I smelled blood. I, I knew somebody died. Ali was all right, but the shrapnel had hit Kijok, my dad's brother, through the temple. Oh my God, all the brain, all the blood, just the whole entire body's blood just comes through here, soak the living room. And of course, we all sob and we you know there's a death in the house now. Now everybody takes serious. After we uh, did his funeral, and that's the time that we decided to take the whole family, leave, leave the land. What killed Kijok, my mom's brother-in-law, my uncle, was a Khmer Rouge rocket. The Khmer Rouge were using rockets more and more in the early to mid-70s. They would fire the rockets into the city without having a specific target, and the shrapnel would kill and injure people. The number of casualties per rocket was small, but it caused terror and chaos. After my uncle was killed, my mom, Ali, Kisung, and his parents left their home in Kampat, took a boat, and fled toward the Vietnam border. When we lived in the border, we... We did not have a house. We lived with someone we know, and oh my God, the water was filthy. Everything was filthy. Nasty living. Very, 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 very bad. Then the grandfather, Kisong's father, he was, he's old, and he's so used to his own place. He said, you know what? I cannot live in a place like this, you know? It's too complicated. So he, he insists to go back. So grandmother said, you know what, I think I'm going to bring your little one back home. At that point, they'd been living along the border for a few months. My mom says violence in Kampat had quieted down. So my dad's parents took Ali back home while my parents got their bearings at the border. At that time, nobody know what the future will bring and nobody know what the, the role in front of us it was so misty. Nobody knows. And we came to the Cambodia border just for temporary. That, that was the plan until stop bombing. They still bomb, but Kampot was, was a little safer. After my grandparents and Ollie left, my mom and dad moved into a different house, which they converted into a business during the day and sold clothes out of. Kisung went back and forth to Kampat a couple of times to bring my grandparents money and baby formula. My mom made the journey once to help out and spend time with Ali. Yeah. Do you remember what she was wearing when you lost saw her? Yeah, she was wearing... Um, I don't know if I remember what she was wearing. Uh, my the favorite color I give her was a little pinkish, a p- pinkish shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's so cute. You know, when I when I went out, she always sit in the door. A year and a half, she sit in the door to wait for me to come home. So sad.
too bad grandfather, grandmother did not want to stay with us. Grandfather was very difficult, otherwise otherwise we, we will have them stay, you know, but they did not want to stay. But where we are is not safe either. It's a Cambodia border and that's where the Khmer Rouge live. They can come by bicycle, they can slaughter everybody, you know. You can probably hear that my mom's trying to explain why they made the decisions they did why they let Kisong's parents take Ali. But you have to realize there was no right or wrong thing to do. There was no playbook for war. My parents remained in that house for as long as they could. The reason we, we stay there because we're hoping to see your sister. We're hoping she'll come one day. We were hoping that somebody would check her out. Somebody would bring grandmother and her out every single day. Every single day, we're hoping to see her. The plan was for everybody to be together again eventually. But my mom and dad were forced to leave the border. During one of Kisong's visits to Kampat, Khmer Rouge soldiers came to the area. My mom was all alone, and she heard gunshots. She called it a slaughtering. They know you're not part of them. They just shot people, gun, and they kill people. You know, even a civilian, so what? They kill you because they know you're not, not one of them. And they also want a territory. You know, they kill you so you get scared, so you leave. Your father wasn't with me, but oh my God. Now I have to take myself and whatever I can take in bicycle and I move myself toward Vietnam. He was lucky somehow. He, he took the bow and then get himself to Vietnam. And that time, that was the end of our, our resident, our business in that border. Once my parents settled in Vietnam, they tried to go back to Kampat to get Ali and Kisong's parents and bring them over the border. But you know what? It thing happened so fast. Boom, boom, boom. The border was blockaded. Yeah, we could not go back. Could not go back. And the next thing they know, the Khmer Rouge gather all the remaining people in the city. No matter where you are, they gather you and fall you into the countryside. You heard about it, right? And turn all everybody, turn them to farmers. What my mom is referring to is April 17th, 1975, when the Khmer Rouge took over Phnom Penh and started evacuating all the cities. The regime had won the civil war and would rule over Cambodia for four years. The goal of Pol Pot, the leader of the Khmer Rouge, was to institute the ultimate totalitarian system enforced by violence and mass killing. Historians and researchers estimate that they killed between 1.7 and 3 million people, or close to a quarter of the country's population. The idea was to develop Cambodia on an agricultural base. The Khmer Rouge forced people from the cities, into the countryside, and into labor camps, where they died of starvation and illness. Others were brutally murdered. As these evacuations were taking place in 1975, my dad's parents left Kampot and walked to the town of Tuk Mia, where my grandmother is originally from. They were still taking care of Ali, along with my grandmother's relatives. Then my grandmother got really sick. So she, she knows she knows she's going to die. So she uh, gave your sister. She hand your sister to her nephew and wife. The couple did not have children. And she said, you know what, I, I give you Kisong's daughter. Please take care of her. <laughs> Give her one day when you see the parent, you give her back to her parents. My dad's cousins cared for Ali for more than three years, and my mom says they loved her. But one day, Khmer Rouge soldiers came to their house with a list. 
On the list were the couple's parents, who'd been landlords. The couple themselves were not on the list. Neither was Ali. City people, educated people, former business leaders, they were all being targeted by the Khmer Rouge as traitors. But the soldiers said the people on the list would simply be relocated. My mom told me about all of this while holding my daughter Acacia in her arms. So the couple who had your sister say, oh, the parents are older now. We have to go where they're going. We like to go with them. He didn't know. So he decided to go with them. So they add them on the list and your sister also on the list and then they killed them all. She was seven years old, and people who came out, who I met, who I have known her, they lived with her, they said she was the, the ni- oh, nicest little girl. So sad. Oh, it took me so long to, to able to repeat the story. Oh. When Vietnamese soldiers defeated the Khmer Rouge in January 1979, many who survived left Cambodia as soon as they could. My mom says people who had known Ali found her in Vietnam to tell her what happened. Up until then, my mom had always held on to hope that she'd see her firstborn again. When I was 20, my mom and I went to Paris and visited relatives who lived there. I remember walking around the Eiffel Tower. My mom was speaking to one of our relatives in a language I didn't understand. Besides English, my mom speaks at least five other languages. So at one point, she turned to me and said, he knew your oldest sister and says she was very kind. You would have liked her. She said this casually and then started talking to our relative again. I didn't ask her to tell me more. So much of my life was like this, hearing small snippets of a long, complicated story. But now I know who that man was. He was one of my dad's cousins. His brother was the one who took Ali in. I probably questioned him a little bit here and there, you know, about what he know. But he and his parents separate too. So they went together, so he wouldn't know that much. All he knew, they were killed. And, you know, all he knew that his brother adopted my my daughter and they were killed together. He had met her, though, so what did he say about her? She's so cute. Oh, she's, she is so adorable. Not only has got very good nature. When a kid have good nature like this, people like them. Do you think about her often? Of course. Of course, I think of her often, you know. I think of Ali a lot, you know, like move on, but I still think of her. You never, you never forget your baby. Never. This episode was written and produced by me, our editor is Julia Shu. Fact check by Harsha Nahata and Tiffany Bowie. Production management and sound design by James Boo. And additional help from Kathy Irway. Original theme music by Avery Stewart. Audio engineering by Dave Waldron and Timothy Lou Lee. Thanks to Ben Kiernan for speaking with me about the historical context of what my family experienced. And of course, special thanks to my mom. If you want to record an oral history interview with someone you love, even if you've never tried it before, check out selfevidentshow.com slash history. 
where you'll find a free toolkit to help you take the next step. Before Me is a self-evident media production. Our executive producers are James Boo, Ken Ikeda, and me. The show also receives support from the Alderworks Alaska Writers and Artists Retreat and the Juno Arts and Humanities Council. I'm Lisa Fu. Thanks for listening. And that is our show. We always want to hear from you. Our email address is codeswitch at npr.org. Follow us on Instagram at nprcodeswitch, all one word. We just wanted to give a quick shout out to our Code Switch Plus listeners. We appreciate y'all. And we thank you for being subscribers. So subscribing to Code Switch Plus means you get to listen to all of our episodes without any sponsor breaks. And it also helps support our show. So if you love Code Switch, please consider signing up at plus.npr.org slash Code Switch. This episode was produced by Diva Motisham. It was edited by Dali Mortada. And we would be remiss if we did not shout out the rest of the Code Switch Massive. That's B.A. Parker. That's Lori Lisa Raka. That's Christina Kala. That's Karen Grigsby Bates. That's Alyssa Jong Perry. Jess Kung, Kumari Devarajan, and Steve Drummond. Our art director is L.A. Johnson. Our intern is Jordanos Tesfazion. Oh, by the way, I'm Gene Demby. Be easy, y'all. You are listening to NPR.